My partner, Micah, snapped his fingers in front of his face, but he didn't react, continuing to stare into the void. Take it away, I commanded the medics, and then turned to my partner. Let's go for a drive. I showed him the passport, taken from the man's jacket pocket, opened on the registration page. It's nearby, let's check what's there. Micah nodded and followed me to the car. Images taken from freepic.com, pixabay.com, canva.com. The man was discovered by a patrolman. He was sitting on the snow-covered sidewalk barefoot, wearing only pants, a t-shirt, and a light jacket swaying from side to side. His clothes were covered in blood. He mumbled something inaudible, and when the patrolman tried to pick him up, he shouted and started waving his arms. Then the patrolman called a squad and an ambulance. And Maja and I were lucky enough to be on duty that night. What do you think? I asked my partner, pulling into the right street. It's amazing how among Moscow's high-rise buildings, there was a private sector with unassuming houses. Household stuff, he said confidently. Now we'll find a wife, if only alive. I thought so too. There was not a scratch on citizen Petrov Ilya Anatolievich, born in 1975. The blood belonged to someone else, and Petrov was in a completely insane state. He didn't answer any questions, only mood, and asked what we wanted from him. The house stood out among the others. In the gray winter darkness, the gnarled fence glared blackly among the white snow. The trees in the garden were bare, despite the snowfall the day before. A chill ran through me as I pushed open the gate, and it creaked open. Micah, too, was quiet and gloomy, staring at the house. Shine a light, I asked when we reached the cleared path to the house. Micah turned on the flashlight, and we saw pools of blood on the porch and door. I put on gloves and gently pulled the door open. It slid open easily, swinging open wide, as if someone was inviting us in. I swallowed. There was a strange silence, like we were in another dimension, where the background sounds were absent. Micah shone a light into the house, picking out with the flashlight beam the bloody footprints that led through a long empty hallway to a room. We stepped inside, and I fumbled for the light switch and turned on the light. The lamp flickered dimly, illuminating the modern decor for a split second, and then went out. I don't like it here, Micah grumbled. I didn't say anything, though I shared his feelings. Continuing to light the way with the flashlight, we walked into the room. The pungent copper smell of blood hit my nose, joined by the sickening musty odor of an old, uninhabited building. Clamping my hand over my nose, I flicked the light switch again, fumbling for it on the wall. The light blinded us, and for a moment we squinted. Fuck, Michael swore. The sight was not for the faint of heart. Even I, who had seen crime scenes many times, felt uneasy. The poor woman was unrecognizable. The walls, furniture, and even the ceiling were gloomy red. I pulled out my cell phone and called the forensics team. It looked like our Petrov had lost his mind and killed his, in all likelihood, wife. When I finished talking, Micah showed me a clean axe-shaped piece of the floor next to the body. Do you think he axed her? I asked. No, my partner answered. The axe was lying here, and then he took it away for some reason. There are no traces of blood on the floor, and if he had killed with that axe, there would have been drops. That's what I was thinking. The man didn't have a weapon on him, so he must have dumped it somewhere. While we were waiting for the brigade, we looked around the house and garden, but found nothing suspicious. The pictures on the dresser showed Petrov with a woman, presumably the murdered one. Images taken from freepic.com, pixabay.com, canva.com. A beautiful happy couple. I was glad there were no children. I hate it when children suffer. The woman was insanely sorry. No one deserves such a horrible death. No sooner had the crew arrived than we were called to another accident where we spent the rest of the night. I didn't get home until 10 in the morning and went straight to bed. Even in my dreams, I was haunted by the bloody walls of that house, hearing voices and laughter, and then a murdered woman appeared. She stretched her hands toward me, one of which had turned into an axe, 
and laughed madly so that her teeth stood out white against the bloody mess of her face. She shouted, kill, kill. I was pulled out of my nightmare by a phone call. Listen, Leok, here's the thing. Michael's voice sounded wary. Can you come over? What happened? Not yet awake, I asked. You'd better come over. Intrigued, I quickly packed and drove to the prosecutor's office, where I was called by Michael, trying to get the image from the dream out of my head. In the duty room, he showed me a table with photos. I immediately recognized yesterday's house and the victim's body. For a moment, it seemed that the photos smelled of the same mustiness that I had felt in that room. Look, Micah slid one photo to me. I took the card in my hands and marveled. In the same place where we had seen the silhouette of the axe, there was an axe of the same shape in the photo. The blade was almost shining. It was unclear whether it was the effect on the photo or whether it was made of some alloy. I looked at Miyu in surprise. Did you find the weapon of crime? Images taken from freepic.com, pixabay.com, canva.com. He shook his head grimly. No luck. I checked the list of items taken from the scene. There's no axe. And I called the guys, asked them in between. Nobody saw him. He finished in a whisper. I felt uneasy. I thought someone had decided to play a stupid joke. But how then? Mika shook his head again. I don't know. What about the detainee? He doesn't remember anything. Not at all. He says he fell asleep yesterday and woke up at our place. He lived with his wife and never had any grief. Neighbors speak well of him. Positive family, no quarrels, no fights. Nothing in his blood, the psychiatrist declared him sane. He's screaming that we're trying to pin a murder on him. I chuckled, the usual song. He's a fool, I said. He's got so much blood on him, he'll never get away with it. He's all right, but the axe, do you want to go down there again? Honestly, I didn't want to. That house scared me on some subconscious level, but I couldn't leave the mystery unanswered. Let's go, I said, and soon we were entering the creepy house again. Breaking the seal, I opened the door. The familiar smell hit my nose again, and for a moment, I thought I heard that voice from the dream. Kill, it whispered against my ear, and a chill ran through my body. Are you okay? Micah asked, and I nodded and moved on. I turned on the light in the murder room and stopped on the threshold. The body had already been taken away, and it was obvious from the mess that a lot of people had been there, but that wasn't what caught my attention. The axe mark on the floor was as clean as it had been yesterday. Micah squeezed past me and squatted down beside it, examining it closer. It's weird, he muttered. It's like I feel like I can reach out and grab it. And he did reach out. An unaccountable fear made me rush toward him and shout, Don't. He looked at me in bewilderment and I, already feeling like an idiot, said, Let's take a picture. Mika perked up, took out his phone, and turned on the camera. But as soon as he got it on the trail, he dropped the phone. Shit, he exclaimed and backed away. That's not how it works. What? What is it? I couldn't take it anymore. So I picked up the phone and looked at it myself. Through the lens on the screen at the sight of the footprint was a real axe. My finger stabbed cold, and at the same time, I felt an irresistible urge to take the axe in my hands. Kill, the voice whispered again and infernal laughter followed. Driving the camera, I reached out and fumbled for the handle. As soon as I touched it, the axe seemed to materialize in our world. I felt the gnarled shaft beneath my fingers, the weighty weight of the axe. Only now the blade didn't shine, but looked old, covered with a layer of caked blood. After the old man's story, everything here looked ominous. Nikolay reproached himself for his suspiciousness and boldly stepped behind the fence. A dusty path wound around the farm buildings and led to the house. Taking the key from the notch at the door, Nikolay opened the lock for the second time that day and went inside. He remembered very well how he had gotten a layer of dust here during the day, but now he saw with a cold chill in his heart that the dust lay in an even layer and not a trace of his presence remained. 
With difficulty swallowing, Nicolay stepped into the largest room. At that moment, the sun touched the horizon, and through the dusty glass, the room was colored with red light. Every object was now tinged with blood, and though it lasted only a few moments, Nicolay was ready to run away in fear. But the light changed to dusk, and exhaling, Nicolay turned on the flashlight, the only modern thing in the house. Pointing it at the floor, he walked the same route he had taken during the day, hoping to find his footprints. But the dust lay softly in an even canvas. But in the dining room, there was a surprise. The chairs were chaotically arranged, as if someone jumped up from them, frightened by the presence of strangers. Although Nikolai perfectly remembered that during the day they stood exactly under the table. But it was something else that made him break into a cold sweat. There were bowls of steaming chowder on the table, and on the floor, several barefoot footprints were appearing out of nowhere. Someone was walking from the table toward Nicolay. Feeling the hair on his head move, he squealed and rushed toward the exit. The heavy wooden door slammed in his face, and he flew face first into the door, screaming and pulling it open. There was a rustle of voices behind him, as if muffled by a wall, and a howl. This horrible howl grew with every second, coming closer and closer. Nikolay banged on the door, feeling tears of fear in his eyes, and then yanked it open again. This time the door yielded, and he almost fell on his back by inertia, but jumped up and ran away from this hellish house. It was only near the fence that he dared to turn around. There were two women in ancient clothes standing in the window, their hands folded pleadingly, looking at him until something jerked them inside. Whispering prayers, Nicholas ran into the village. The old man was sitting in the same spot and waiting for him. As soon as Nicholas came closer, the old man stood up and beckoned him into the house with his hand. Well, are you taking the farm? He squeaked, letting Nikolai into the house. Nikolai shook his head, unable to utter a word. Tomorrow he would leave here and never come back. 